I V M. Hello, hello, we're Team Splainer. Welcome to an all new episode of Press Decode, a weekly podcast where we take Splainer's mission to declutter the news one step further. Check out our newsletter for more stories. We've also got a one month free trial for you if you haven't subscribed yet. It'll be in the show notes. But now it's time to sit back, relax, and don't let the news give you the blues. I'm Prafula, your host for the day, and it's just me and Sara today. As always, we have three segments in this episode. In our big story, we're looking at the rising tide of demands from Hindu quarters to worship in current or erstwhile mosques in the country. For the food for thought segment, we're talking about the use of like in our speech. You know, like how we go like, like all the time. And then in our final segment, we will be roasting and toasting our fave and least fave items. And now on to our big story. So you may have heard of the Gyanwapi Mosque controversy. If not, here's a short recap. The Kashi Vishwanath Temple in Varanasi at one time. And this was first destroyed by Kutubuddin Aibak. Now, Kutubuddin Aibak is also infamous for allegedly destroying temples and building the Kutub Minar. We've done a whole explainer and a podcast episode on this. So we will link that below and recommend that you check that out. But back to the mosque. So the Kashi temple was rebuilt and destroyed several times during the Mughal rule. It was last destroyed by Aurangzeb, who built the Gyanwapi Mosque on the temple's ruins in 1669. And the queen of Indore, Ahilya Bai Holkar, built the current existing Kashi Vishwanath temple in 1780. And the temple and the mosque are about 100 meters away from each other, like the original location. And the temple shares a wall with the mosque. So that's all there is about the mosque. Now the news. In April, five women filed a petition demanding the right to perform puja at a holy site called Ma Shringar Gauri Sthal. They said it is uh, present on the mosque premises at the back of the western wall of the Gyanwapi Masjid. Obviously, the former chair of the temple said that the holy site is somewhere else. So the petitioners demanded that there be a survey of the site. A local court in Varanasi then ordered a video survey and this was opposed by the masjid committee saying you cannot video inside the mosque. The survey did finally happen but the findings are not yet out. But someone has come out and said that a shivling was found in the mosque pond. The masjid committee however says it's a fountain and the whole thing just goes on and on. Then there is the Shahi Idga mosque in Mathura which is uh, more recent. The controversy, I mean. This is allegedly built on the birthplace of Lord Krishna or the Krishna Janmabhumi. So there are demands that the mosque be shifted and a court in Mathura is reportedly hearing a petition currently. Now the biggest concern on everyone's minds is, is, are these mosques going to be the next Babri Masjid? The demands for these two mosques to be moved existed even in 91 at the height of the Ram Janmabhumi movement which eventually led to the demolition of the masjid in 92. But since it didn't happen then, will it happen now? Is it easier? Is it simple to do it now? What does the law say about it? Is it allowed at all? Okay, so the future of all these claims, including one about Qutub Minar that we've spoken about in an earlier pod episode that I'll link below, and one that I read just about minutes before we started recording about something in Mangalore about a 700-year-old Malali mosque, and how Mm -hmm. recent renovation sometime in April led to a temple-like structure being unearthed there. All of these, like the future of all these claims, hinge on something called the Places of Worship Act 1991. Mm. So this act was passed at the peak of the Ayodhya Ram Janmabhumi movement, and it essentially passed the conversion of any of a religious place of one community into a place of worship of any other community. Quite simple. And the character of any such religious place is supposed to remain the same as it was in August 1947, aka when we gained independence. So it also ruled that all legal challenges based on any pre-independence claims stating otherwise shall be suspended and no new claims will be entertained. The law, however, makes a specific exception for the Babri Masjid because considering like I mentioned, uh, like (laughs) shout out to the second part of the pod that's yet to come. Like I mentioned earlier, it was passed at the peak of the Ram Janmabhumi movement of the 90s. 
and since it was sub judice they didn't want to interfere essentially but mm-hmm. the logic was very simple it was since like you mentioned right rulers have come and gone and attacked places of worship as a symbol of power it was right. how far back can you go so basically an independence is where we draw the line and like when i say it was at the peak of the ram janma bhoomi movement you have to understand the political turmoil that this country was going through so yeah. the bjp leader lk advani had been arrested in bihar for leading his rath yatra the then up chief minister mulayam singh yadav had ordered the police to shoot at car sevaks who were trying to tear down the babri masjid so in these trying times is when the congress government led by narsimha rao they decided it's time to assure the muslim community that even if they accept the claims of hindu organizations on like babri other mosques throughout the country would remain protected hmm. within about a year of this law being passed by december 6th 1992 the babri masjid was demolished in a moment that comes to define our politics to date and even back then the political right of the country despite the situation that the law was passed in and why Honestly I think was very important to have been passed. Yep. Political right of the country vehemently opposed the law. So a then MP Uma Bharti of the BJP even name checked the Gyanwapi mosque back in the 90s saying was it not the intention of Aurangzeb behind leaving remnants of the temple at the site of the mosque to keep reminding Hindus of their historical fate and to remind coming generations of Muslims of their past glory and power. I like the confidence with which you are Historians can say what they want. Uma <laughs> Bharti knows what Aurangzeb was thinking. What's going on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she, she knew this is exactly what the dude was up to. Now, what is important to note is that the law came back to the limelight more recently in 2019 when the Ayodhya judgment was passed by the Supreme Court, which essentially awarded the disputed land to the Hindu petitioners and gave the Muslim side five acres of land in a different location. The court had then emphasized the importance of the act and reinforced the fact that the Babri question was an exception as intended. It added and I'm going to quote, historical wrongs cannot be remedied by the people taking the law in their own hands. In preserving the character of places of public worship, parliament has mandated in no sort uncertain terms that history and its wrongs shall not be used as instruments to oppress the present and the future. So the court categorically laid out that this is it, but now the act itself is being questioned in court again, and it doesn't help that a Mathura court, in context of the Shahi Idgah Mosque, declared that the 1991 act does not apply to the case only by reasoning out that the decree was drawn before the commencement of the act of 1991, and since the same is the subject matter of the challenge in the suit moved by the petitioner, the act shall not be applicable on this dispute. despite the fact that the act clearly mentioned there is one and one exception only so yeah as much as there is indeed a law in place one can't really be sure about the turn of events things can take in this country especially at the times that we live through <laughs> so i suppose we wait and watch that is true but also you know while you were reading that quote out i was thinking how in the last what two and a half three years common sense seems to have literally just left because and it's interesting that you bring up the act you know because when we were researching this i saw and i read that a couple of other people have noticed a pattern in the concerns around these mosques in fact some people have also noted that events around gyanwapi are very similar to those that led to the babri demolition in the first place so uh, this is a quote from a caretaker of the gyanwapi mosque they said before the babri masjid was demolished the area around it was cleared everything around it was brought down till the mosque stood alone and exposed and because the area was cleared it meant lakhs could gather they did and eventually demolished the mosque which is chilling right mm, yeah yeah so this is in context of the kashi vishwanath temple corridor this was inaugurated with so much pomp back in december and if you followed it at all you'll know that the inauguration oh my goodness the way it took over the city i'm not right? seeing anything but certain outfits were donned hmm no but i remember thinking that the entire city was absolutely taken over and looked so different and the fact that the event itself celebrated hindu pride out and out in such a manner it was and nobody said anything was well i guess a sign of things to come 
Yeah. And you know the reactions are of the locals in each of these cases of the mosques have been very different and very interesting because with the Kashi corridor locals and a lot of them were Hindus were unhappy with the restoration but this is because the government raised narrow lanes and about 250 buildings this included smaller temples built between the 17th and 19th centuries and so in creating more room for pilgrims to visit the temple they tore down several people's livelihoods and homes so in their anger some people went as far as calling it an attack on the hindu faith and uh, someone was even quoted as saying modi or yogi hindu nahi hai aurangzeb se bhi bure hai so that is how much rage there was wow imagine that's going to hit hard oh yeah but you know in contrast when it comes to the gyanwabi mosque after the news of the survey and the shivling came in many locals expressed basically unfettered support because one person said the court has sought a report so that truth can come out and harmony can be maintained in both the communities and the nation can know the truth about the history we are happy with the order as we have been saying it for a long time another person says the survey is very necessary only then the truth will come out there should not be any opposition to the survey these are the same people who were protesting having their homes and shops knocked down because of a temple corridor and again in contrast so the kutub controversy coming back to that a saket judge has said uh, because there was a plea to recognize the fact that there are deities or idols in the compound and that kutub minar is basically a temple or was destroyed and the parts of the temple were used to construct it the judge said this i'm re- paraphrasing but this is what he said indeed if a deity is in the compound they have survived 800 years without worship and can do so even now so the responses around this have basically been whiplash one is absolute outrage one is saying oh we need a survey and this is probably a temple not a mosque one guy is saying you know let the monument be uh granted this is different contexts and parts of the country uh, you see like you know the divide is very obvious class divides yeah. and political divides there's the whole majority versus minority plot that is going on right and there are definitely political undertones to it so i guess nothing more to say then you know it would do us all good to remember how these things play out when they're leveraged for political gain yeah i think you've said it best <laughs> It is about the political gains at the end. Yeah. So on that note, we come to the end of our first segment. We'll be right back after a short break. You're listening to Press Decode on the IVM Podcast Network. We face a hundred dilemmas every day while raising our children and nurturing our families. Why not let science help us make informed decisions to solve our dilemmas? Hi, I'm Devi Shobha, and I'm Meghna. We host. Big talk about tiny humans where we will help you unpack challenges around parenting and your child's development and more importantly we will equip you with research backed strategies that you can readily act on tune in to our podcast every wednesday on the ibm podcasts app website or your favorite podcast platforms Hello and welcome back to Press Decode on the IVM Podcast Network. We're Team Splainer and in today's Food for Thought, we're talking about filler words in language. Like, um, you sort of know, like, you know, these. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Have you ever judged someone or been at the receiving end of judgment for using too many likes in your speech? Like, I can tell you, I'm at mm-hmm. the receiving end. You guys have heard us, what, 41 episodes now? Yeah. <laughs> you know just how much i use and misuse them like think about it you're answering a question narrating an event or explaining and expressing your feelings or even agreeing with someone he i know right like i get that i use it more for the effect more than anything that is true yet it's seen as something stupid or lazy and it apparently makes the person using it as inarticulate or dumb or just a bad communicator I would strongly argue that I'm a good communicator who just likes fillers. <laughs> so in the midst of all this last week, sometime last week, we chanced upon a like a great read in the argument which is a very strong support for the use of the word like. 
something that tells us that we're not stupid and perhaps even intelligent <laughs> so i sure as hell would like to revisit that argument so prafulla look i think we are both in agreement with this guardian piece like you said like as a teenager i got told off for using like in sentences a lot then i started getting told off because i was starting my sentences with so See the opposition against like I get, but so was ridiculous. I was like, I'm trying to explain something to you. I was, you know, I thought I'd be right? very conscious about you know saying the word like while we were talking about this, but I've at least said it three times by now. See, and you, so with me, I think the funny part mm-hmm. with me was I used to, especially in like my teens, I used to pick up a word per season. So for about three months, it would be the same word. So they're just yeah, like, dude. this is incredibly annoying because you don't. <laughs> For three months, that's all you say. <laughs> I had fillers by season. I have done that too, and I have gotten told off a lot of times. Which is why I am really glad for this Guardian piece because I found out that people have been defending the usage of like as long as it's been in use. In 1992, a dude called Malcolm Gladwell wrote that it actually carries a rich emotional nuance, and I have to agree. The writer of the Guardian article says that they use the word "like" while doing interviews, and this got me thinking about my own experiences interviewing people. I realized, like, we tend to use "like" in sentences as a way to give other people cues or suggest something or intonate. And what I also realized is there's a bit of sexist coloring. One second, here. I'm gonna come here with a personal confession for press oh. record listeners. So when I overly prepare for episodes that i'm not entirely confident about i actually spruce it up with extra likes and so is to show <laughs> that i'm not like i didn't fully learn this like it's informal <laughs> i mean helps yeah yeah it's a way of saying you know this is off the top of my head so i'm going to use likes and nah. so is, so it sounds I natural think about this all the time <laughs> this is like my general it's my brain hmm No, but you know, I also found out. I feel like I knew this, but I also like it was put down on paper that there's a bit of sexist coloring to why people don't like because it's seen as something girlish and dumb. So think like of the course. bimbo trope or dumb blondes or Kelly from the Valley. But women don't use like any more than men do, dude. I mean, Shakespeare used it in Twelfth Night. Can you believe it? I don't know the exact dialogue now, but vindication at its best. Truly, truly, and obviously it's used as a verb, as a preposition. But linguists also say that like in its modern usage is a shortened version of the word likely. So it's really not a dumb phrase to say. So I understand that it does sound a bit grating if you're hearing it constantly. How we sure though? No, but here's the thing. Uh, there was an episode in Love Island in 2017, a five-minute exchange. Okay, the word "like" was uttered 76 times, once every four seconds. Oh my god! Exactly. <laughs> so I okay, understand. Fair. I see your point. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I feel like I'm able to process and formulate what I want to say better when I use fillers and pauses. and i've always found it easier to listen to somebody when they use words like that and there are studies to back it up so from i'm quoting directly from a study this says as speakers we are often aware if we speak too complexly the listener might not understand we use these items pretty unconsciously to help the person process what we're saying so you know obviously is the prejudice comes from stereotypes say, of gendered and other minorities being seen as inefficient and ineloquent but also what i don't like about this is that it suggests there's only one correct way for languages to operate and you can't think that when we live in the internet age again this is an audio pod but you can't see like the sheer amount of agreement and excitement agreement. i have when i'm hearing <laughs> someone say this like this is my echo chamber <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, but you, I had this thought right before we got on to record, right? What we use now as internet lingo, we wouldn't understand like a year ago, let alone five years ago. Language is constantly changing and dynamic. How can you say there's only one way for a language to operate apart from like you know one standardized way for everybody to talk? But 
it's there isn't just one right way because there's dialects, there's slang, regional quirks, and who's dictating what's right or proper grammar really? Correct. Thank you. <laughs> it's like the best segue I could get ever. <laughs> like beyond like the stunning argument for why the word like is clearly put a sign of intelligence. I'm not even like I was first gonna say like you know I'm going out in a limb, but no, we're not. We all agree right now. <laughs> like beyond the stirring defense like i do believe that policing language and i don't know having a perfect and imperfect version of it is truly one of the most exclusionary practice that we as a people could ever come up with like language has one damn purpose communication and as long as my point is put across and you can comprehend exactly what i'm trying to say Pray tell what is the problem if my sentence structures are wrong or god forbid i use the sinful fillers thank you i mean at this <laughs> point we're just going to keep agreeing and hyping each other <laughs> up this is the entire food for thought segment we're sorry if someone disagrees like sucks to suck <laughs> so in the same garden piece there is this linguist that argues that calling out language or forming biases based on the way one speaks is actually one of the most persistent prejudices across the world she says and i quote most people aren't even aware this is something they might do for example if they're interviewing candidates for a job it's easy to think you're not being biased racist or sexist that you're just mm-hmm. looking for a good communicator but so many of our perceptions of who makes this good communicator can be infused by other forms of biases that we're not aware of which is right. so true like the idea of perfect language only comes from a place of privilege and that, that's precisely it okay so back in middle school i was actually one of those god awful grammar nazis so to say uh. i apologize okay like this is me undoing apologizing anyway like don't even get me started on the problematics of it like right from the word nazi being normalized as a word in humor mm-hmm. to the behavior of this so called grammar nazi which i think to date 2022 sara would straight up call being a douche like it doesn't help right that we live in india a country where our first language isn't even english like why mm. do we get so unnecessary about policing this language then and it's so much gatekeeping but you know when i was writing this and i was thinking about the use of the word and you know policing mm-hmm. language i was also reminded about i think two episodes ago when we were talking about the language debate yeah uh i remember vagda spoke about how when people were talking about hindi versus english and why one versus the other a lot of people who were against hindi actually brought out the most interesting point that a lot of the shuddh hindi is just essentially a sanskritized version of hindi which was unintelligible to the hindi speaking hindu itself which is the main population that ought to be speaking it i mean when you are gatekeeping at least figure out where and whom you're gatekeeping from <laughs> so i guess it isn't only about the elitism of english in india per se but it's simply about power systems and you know who then gets to control this right notion of language and that folks was my socio lesson for the day <laughs> on that note now that we know sara was a socio major we come to the end of this segment <laughs> we will be back after a short break you are listening to press take code on the ivm podcast hey it's been another great week on the ivm podcasts network on think fast varun and suchita discuss lady gaga's brand relaunch and patreon's creator survey On Press Decode, Sara Vagda and Prafula explore the mental health issues that plague our armed forces. On IVM Likes, Snehil Antariksh Abbas and Jalasmi indulge in a friends versus how I met your mother debate. On Smarter with Sid, Siddharth introduces us to the concept of dream journaling. And on Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav tells us how a 400-year-old curse, coffee and Indian Chinese food are all related. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcasts has just launched its merch and our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcasts website and click on the shop tab to check out our first collection of t-shirts. Do follow us on social media. We are IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. 
And remember, if you are enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Don't forget to rate us on any platforms you are listening on. You can also check us out on YouTube. We are also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate if you could spare a few minutes to fill it. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week: SBI Life Insurance, Jupiter, a digital banking app, and Cap Gemini. Get the future you want. Welcome back to Press the Code on the IVM Podcast Network. It's time for our final segment this week, Roast or Toast, and we did have a little bit of a tussle because everyone wanted the least fave, but <laughs> Prafulla has it <laughs> since she's been so true to it. She gets so. Mad. Look, I promised a series, and I am indulging yes. myself as well as you guys. So, in more rich people doing stupid things, there's this American actor called Scott Green. and he has a collection of nfts he was scammed out of four of these including one board ape now why is this even a topic of conversation well what i found out about board apes is the fact that you can basically use them for your own creative purposes so mm-hmm. i mean already like ownership around nfts is a very gray area but uh, scott green had an nft a board ape and he developed a tv show around this ape and this ape was going to be the main character remember what i said about okay. like creative licenses so and uh-huh. recently he went to crypto bro conference and he looked devastated crypto bro conference <laughs> i'm not even going to say the name it's just crypto bro conference okay So at one okay. of the panels I think or some interview he looked devastated and he said I bought that ape in July 2021 and have spent the last several months developing and exploiting the IP to make it into the star of the show then days before his name is Fred by the way days before he set out to make his world debut he is literally kidnapped Fred kidnapped so somebody has stolen his NFT and because it is an nft he really can't he's not really an owner right and he's lost all creative and copyright license over the main character of the show that he spent a year developing so right clip save screwed his life yeah i love this to oh my god i love this segment profulla i'm so glad i gave the least wave to you yes i <laughs> promised a series guys i promised a series i'm here for it <laughs> Okay so clearly like I lost the battle I have a fave item <laughs> and I'm not disappointed really so this is my fave for very self fulfilling purposes like I I don't even know if anyone cares if I haven't said it before on the pod I have an exceptionally unhealthy obsession with drinking coke <laughs> my mother would dislike <laughs> agree from anywhere she is listening to this <laughs> and the only thing I actually feel very guilty about when I drink the unreal amounts of coke is not like my health or anything because I'm dumb like that is the sheer amount of plastic waste that it creates and then i think about like the sheer multitude of other people who would be drinking the same amounts of coke and then i feel really really shitty so anyway my fave item recently coke has announced that it will now come in plastic bottles whose caps remain attached even after you open them the reason the design is supposed to make it easier to recycle the whole package all at once and keep caps out of the trash Coke grandly announced this is a small change that we hope will have a big impact ensuring that when consumers recycle our bottles no cap gets left behind I can sense so the disdain dramatic. of anyone who's listening thank you I can sense the disdain I know it's probably a gimmick I'm smart enough to realize that and I'm aware that the amount of plastic that is produced and goes into the landfills does not change But oh well, as much as Coke is trying to soothe its guilt, it's also soothing my guilt tiny, tiny bit, and I'm <laughs> going to live in that bubble for a while. Well, on that note, that was our show this week. Thank you so much for joining us on Press T Code. You can catch us every Thursday on the IVM Podcast Network. And guys, please remember: don't let the news give you the blues. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com/survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So I mean like we'll do a random drawing of like maybe 10 people and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com/survey where you can fill out the survey. 
Ladies, I'm sure you will relate to it if I say that we are constantly busy with work, studies, cooking and what not. And amidst all of this, we often forget an important element that needs our desperate attention, finance. So here we are, bringing to you SBI Life Presents, A Sip of Finance. A women exclusive podcast where we will teach you how to manage personal finances in a simple and straightforward way with your host Priyanka Acharya a finance expert who's been in the industry for 14 plus years and not just in English but in seven more languages so tune in every Tuesday for fresh episodes on the IBM podcast network and all major podcast streaming platforms